starting with this morning and going to now, we're wrapping up what might be considered your first SACS experiment, right? We start with uh, sample prep, experiments at the beam line, data validation, uh, model reconstructions to get a picture of your system, and now we talk about what you need to do to publish that. The SACS data, as I hope you've been coming to realize, is extremely powerful. It can tell you a lot about your systems, but as we've been emphasizing, there are many ways it can go wrong. Uh, so you have to be very careful. And when you're doing the analysis, you have to take care to not fool yourself. And when you're presenting your data, you need to do it correctly so that you're not fooling your reviewers or your readers accidentally. Um, there are ways that you can unintentionally mislead them into you know, not seeing everything about the data or not seeing certain features just by leaving out certain plots or putting things in the wrong way. It's really important to, especially for SACS data, to accurately and honestly present the strengths and limitations of the data. Data doesn't have to necessarily be perfect to be usable. It really depends on what you're trying to say. Uh, for example, if you have a very small amount of aggregate in the system, you could probably still use that data to say something about the flexibility of the sample, but it wouldn't be trustworthy to say something about the overall size or shape. This talk is really all stemming from this paper. I put up the citation here in full. Uh, so this was published in 2017. It's Publication Guidelines for Structural Modeling Small Angle Scattering Data from Biomolecules and Solution. Uh, and it was really driven by Jill Truella, but a number of people in the community collaborated on this to put together what they saw at the time as kind of the best practice guidelines for publishing SACS data in a way that presents it transparently and so the readers can accurately evaluate what you've done. Really, the goal of this is, is to provide enough information that the readers can independently assess the quality of the data and the models presented and that they know exactly what they're seeing. Uh, this includes reporting guidelines, uh, summary tables for sample details, data acquisition reduction, data presentation analysis and validation, structural modeling, uh, recommended figures that you should include for kind of basic data validation purposes. It's a really nice paper. They also include an example report with all the figures, all the tables, using sex acts from three well-known proteins, so you can see exactly how they do it and what information they provide. And uh, as I'll reemphasize at the end, uh, if you go to the website, uh, download, check out this paper, it has a template reporting table in Word that you can download and fill in. They don't even have to remake the table yourself. Let me start going through the publication guide. Um, this is kind of the first figure they recommend you include of your SACS data. So this is for a SACS experiment. Figure A, they recommend you include the scattering intensity versus frame or time number with the RG plotted. This is what Kushal showed earlier in his talk. Uh, this allows you to kind of assess how well separated your data is, if you have a good flat region where you can pick the data out of, or otherwise if you have to do something else to it to, to get out information. Once you've established this and you have the scattering profiles, then they recommend plotting those on a log lin plot, which lets you see kind of the shape in the higher Q range, the mid to high Q, and they recommend plotting the guinea A. In addition to this, I actually recommend you have a guinea residuals in there, which is not something that is in this paper, but uh, regardless, you should definitely have a guinea plots in there because this, as you may recall, is kind of the primary way to assess whether or not your data is of decent quality. You have linear guinea all the way down to the lowest Q is the fit good. This lets you see kind of the shape and overall scale of the scattering profiles that you're working with. This lets you assess the data quality. The next thing they recommend is that you then present the dimensionless cracky plot. So we talked about this in the morning as well. Uh, so this lets you directly compare kind of on, a, on the same scale shape and flexibility between the different samples in your paper. Uh, and then they recommend you put the P of R function so that you can see that real space representation. You can see that it's coming down to zero nicely, that we don't have any aggregates or inter-particle interactions showing up here. They recommend that you present these normalized by area, which means divided by I of zero. This should pretty much all look familiar. These four plots are essentially what I spent an hour this morning talking about in the data validation. That's the reason that they recommend you present these is because seeing these are what lets you assess the initial data quality of the paper. 
without these. If someone just presents a bead model, you shouldn't trust it because you have no idea if their data was of any good. Maybe they had aggregates in there that's biasing the model. Uh, maybe the buffer subtraction was off. Whatever it was, if you can't see this data set, you don't have any way to assess whether or not they've done a good job in the data collection and whether it's worth trusting the analysis. I mean, hopefully they have, but people make mistakes. So, Additionally, uh, they recommend two more plots. Uh, these they recommend as supplementary figures. Um, it's the same intensity that we saw in the previous plot for the secolution plotted with the UV curve, so you can make sure that they correspond as well as you'd expect them to and that there's no strangeness going on in the elution. Uh, I say as well as you should expect them to because UV is corresponding to concentration where SACS corresponds to molecular weight times concentration. So you're going to have deviations in these curves if you have more than one peak. You have to scale them at some point. Uh, the red curve is particularly a good example where the, it's overscaled here and then underscaled here because concentration and molecular weight are not stacking up quite the same as just concentration. Uh, additionally, then they recommend you present the log-log plot, which lets you really dig down into the low-Q region and make sure that looks okay. So this emphasizes these low-Q features of interest for kind of data quality purposes. That's all the kind of basic presentation. That, that gets you through collecting SACS data, presenting it for anything you're doing. But almost every uh, data, almost all the data you're going to publish has some kind of model dependent analysis as well. That was all the model independent stuff. Then you have the model dependent. This could be a reconstruction. This could be fitting the scattering from a, a high resolution structure against the data set to see if it agrees. Uh, this could be an ensemble reconstruction type thing. Whatever it is, I recommend you plot the data, you plot the fit, and then you plot the normalized residual for the fit. The, the residual in my mind is kind of key here because if you just look at the data and the fits, especially if you're not looking too closely, you might say they agree pretty well. But then, especially for the black and the red, if you look at those two curves, you see that there is actually systematic deviations in the residual that indicate mismatches in the fit. And so these models aren't as good as they might look on first glance. Um, so this is very important for whatever you're presenting. Depending on the paper, this could potentially go in the supplement, but it should be there if you have a model-dependent analysis. Then, of course, there's pictures of all your models, things like that. That varies for each model, so I'm not going to include it. But uh, after that, we start digging into the recommended tables. Uh, so the first thing, it's pretty much everything you should know about your sample going into the beam line. You could even fill this out before you came. That might be a good idea. Uh, so it's, you know, what, are, what sample are you running? How did you get it? How did you, where did you get it from? What's the extinction coefficient? What's the size? Uh, here's what we're, the column you're running it on at the sample. What's the, or at the beam line, what's the buffer that it's in? All these bits and pieces you, just kind of need the report so that people know exactly what you've got and what you've done. And if they want to replicate it, they have all the information. It's not so interesting. So this portion is the data collection parameters. Uh, this is everything that you need to know about the beamline. Generally speaking, this is not something we expect you to know. When you come to BioCat to do an experiment, we will actually provide all of these parameters for you at experiment time. Um, You'll get a nice handout uh, with all of this on it. So you can have that to take home and use with your data. But these are all the relevant parameters that you would need to know to evaluate the data based on what the instrument looks like. And uh, according to Jill, the main reason that these are in here is that they allow you to catch, more easily catch kind of fraudulent data or data that people have chopped off because the low Q doesn't look good or something like that. You can easily just kind of take a look at these parameters, say, no, you really should have been able to measure that further out. Something's going wrong. You know, something's off with the presentation. I don't think that's an issue for anyone here, but it's still important for the community to have this to build trust in the data sets that we have. Next, they ask that you report the software used for data analysis and reduction. Uh, again, this is something we'll provide for you for the beamline portion, the data reduction. All the analysis is stuff you can fill out yourself. Provide both the software package name 
and the version number, which is important because if the software package changes how it's doing a certain type of approach, if someone tries to reproduce your results using a newer version and they can't get the same thing, they might waste a lot of time trying to figure out what's going on. And if possible, if it's available, which it usually is, please include the citation for the software package. Uh, a lot of people making software rely on citation numbers to justify continued funding to continue making software. So, you know, make sure you include it. It's the most commonly missed thing in method sections, at least that I see, is missing citations to software or missing version numbers. Then we have the structural parameters. So this is the data validation. This is guinea fit, P of R analysis. The report, you know, I0, RG, QMIN, QRG max, quality of the fit, molecular weight you got from I of zero, same kind of parameters for P of R. When available, report the uncertainties in those numbers as best you can. Uh, for modeling results, report the relevant modeling results. They actually have, this is for bead models I could go through, but chi squared, NSD, these are things that Kushal has talked about. Um, there's ways to estimate the resolution of the model reconstruction, so report that. The volume estimate. Um, for more extensive modeling, there are more extensive parameters that can be reported. I'm not going to go through these, but you can take a look at the paper if you do this kind of thing. It gives you a good guide for what the important parameters are and how to evaluate what's going on in your system. Uh, so, to quote, Jill Truella, um, these guidelines are extremely thorough, and if you follow them as best you can, you won't mislead or be misled. There's a lot of ways that you can subtly bias your analysis of SACS data, your reader's evaluation of your SACS data without even intending to, just by leaving out certain portions, skipping pieces. Um, I had at the last workshop that we did, which was uh, the Beyond RG workshop here in August uh, that we participated in, I had a student show me a, another group's paper and they're saying, we're trying to reproduce these facts results. You know, we're not getting, is this, does this look reasonable? And they, they were missing various pieces of, of the data that you need to evaluate it. They hadn't shown the guinea fits, for example. So you're just looking at the profiles and I'm going, well, I have no idea if there's, you know, any aggregate in there. I don't know what's going on. I can't, I can't tell what the quality of this data that they're presenting is. And so I can't tell you if your results should agree or not. Um, and so it's, it's not a good thing for the community uh, to, to run into those situations. And I, my suspicion is that there wasn't anything bad, bad going on with that paper, it's just the group didn't know any better. And so they didn't know all the pieces you need to put in to evaluate what you're seeing. So please make sure you follow these guidelines. They have this table you can download and fill out, it makes it a lot easier. It still takes time, it's a couple hours, but you spend a year or two working on this project, what's a couple hours, right? Make sure you get it right. So SACS additionally these days is pushing into data deposition. That's typically now recommended but not required that you deposit your SACS data in an online repository. Uh, the most commonly used of these is, and I think mainly the only one used at the moment, is the SAS BDB, which is run out of uh, EMBL in Hamburg. And I think there are over a thousand now. This is an old screenshot, um, maybe over 2,000. But essentially, it's aiming to be kind of like the protein data bank, but for SACS data, raw data deposition, model deposition. This is a good thing. Um, you can deposit it. You can get uh, links for reviewers before it goes public so they can take a look at your data. You can download other people's data if there's models in there that are similar to yours or data sets that should be identical. It lets you directly compare. So this is a, a powerful tool for the community, and as it grows, I think we'll see a lot more use from it. So I do recommend this, but journals are not yet requiring it. Additionally, uh, beyond the general statements and things about publishing at BioCAD, in addition to getting the science right, we do need you to help us. As Srinivas mentioned in his talk this morning, we rely on our continued ability to run a SACS facility here on user productivity and publications. The way we justify our existence is you guys doing good science. But in addition to doing good science, you need to make sure we know you're doing good science. So when you publish results from BioCAT or any similar facilities with similar type of funding, you need to include an acknowledgments that acknowledges our funding and the APS's funding. Again, whenever you come to the Beamline, you'll get this. It's also on our website. 
as I was saying, user output is how we justify our existence to the NIH. So if you want to keep collecting SACS data here, you need to acknowledge us when you publish the SACS data. Uh, additionally, since we're an NIH-funded facility, any publications from our resource have to be submitted to PubMed with, uh, in compliance with the NIH public access policy. Final slide. Uh, there's a lot of things here. It's complicated. SACS data is tough, especially your first few experiments. We want you to get it right. If you have questions about the data analysis, contact us. Uh, especially for first experiments, uh, Srinivas and I are very happy to take a look at your data set. Often, if users need it, especially if it needs more complex analysis, we'll, we can be full collaborators on the data processing with them and on publishing the paper. I think you've been co-author on something like 17 user papers in the last two or three years? 30 in the last three. Okay, there you go. My numbers are low. Um, so this is something we do quite commonly, and we're happy to do it. The usual goal is that we uh, do this for your first few data sets if you need it, and then eventually you develop the independence to do it on your own, and we can move on to working with others. We do. Just generally speaking, if you have a question, let us know. If you want us to read your methods section, check your analysis, make sure it all looks good, please just send it to us. It's a lot easier for us to take a look now than to have to you know, publish a correction a year down the road. Uh, additionally, anytime you collect data, you should get a handout with the acknowledgments, a sample methods section, relevant tables for the publication of all the beamline parameters filled out. Take a look. This is not online because the beamline parameters change from run to run. We update the setup, and we don't want people using information on a new setup when they collect it on the old one. So you'll get a hard copy with each experiment you come. Please keep track of it, or if you let us know later when you did your experiment, we can follow up and let you know what the right parameters were. Uh, so that's all I have to say about publication. It's very important. It's a little bit boring, but sometimes that's what you have to do to <laughs> make sure everything's okay. So I can take any questions, if there are any. Jesse, can you go back to the previous slide? So there have been a couple of instances recently of uh, people confronted by uh, character limits. And if you have to choose between my name and the grant number, please, I'd be glad <laughs> to sacrifice my name. Because if you omit my name, my feelings get hurt. If our grant doesn't get acknowledged, sometimes our funding doesn't get started. So, <laughs> I think if I can offer some advice from, from this side of the wall is that you can write a paper, get all this information in, take advantage of supplemental. As long as the reviewers and the readers of the Earth Care have access to that information, that's really what's most important. You might be trying to tell a biological narrative with a lot of different pieces of data. So it's understood that characters can be a premium, but at the end of the day, the acknowledgement section, the supplemental, should give you the space to put in those necessary analysis, especially with biophysics in general. So don't let your collaborators put in those categories. 